1977, paramedics were dispatched to Graceland. Elvis Presley's girlfriend, Ginger Alden, was there at the time, along with one of Elvis's closest friends, Joe Esposito. Elvis Presley was a legend, beloved by millions, but the circumstances surrounding his death have been shrouded in mystery. For the first time, dramatic new evidence that proves that Elvis Presley was more than the king of rock and roll, much more. What secret business was Elvis Presley conducting with two different American presidents? Why was Elvis Presley's middle name misspelled on his own grave? Who was this man, photographed at Elvis's house four months after Elvis allegedly passed away? I started traveling. Who was this mysterious phone caller, captured in a conversation recorded in 1981? Why is Elvis Presley's name found on over 1,400 pages of FBI documents? And why are some of these documents still classified? All this and much more. From the Imperial Palace Hotel and Casino and the Legends in Concert showroom in Las Vegas in a television exclusive, the real story behind the event that shocked the world, the Elvis Files. Maria Columbus is the president of the oldest Elvis fan club. 30, 40 minutes later, Vernon Presley called us. Monty Nicholson is an investigator for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. The body may very well not have been Elvis Presley. Gail Brewer Giorgio is the best-selling author of Is Elvis Alive? and The Elvis Files. The only place it's misspelled is at the plaque at Graceland, the final resting place. Paul Wiest is an internationally renowned handwriting expert. And handwriting notations were made on them, and Elvis Presley's own handwriting. Luc Dion is an author and political advisor to the Quebec government and a foreign consultant. But Elvis Presley was a, a federal agent, there's no doubt about that. All these men and women share one thing. They believe that Elvis Presley may still be alive. They will tell you why. And now, our host on The Elvis Files, Bill Bixby. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and welcome to the Elvis Files. Now, the stage was Elvis Presley's second home. He spent much of his life performing live to millions of his adoring fans. But we're here to look at another side of Elvis. F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in one's mind at the same time. Well, that's what we're asking you to do. Now, I'm sure if we took a hand vote, most of us believe that Elvis Presley passed away August 16th, 1977. Would you raise your hands? All right. Now, may we see hands for those who think that Elvis may be alive. Very interesting. Thank you. All right, I must say that I was inclined to go along with the first group. But we think that by the end of our program, you too will be able to hold two opposing ideas in your mind. First, that Elvis Presley passed away in 1977, and secondly, that he still may be alive. 
Some of the reasons why you might be able to do this are contained right in here. Inside these FBI files is dramatic evidence that there was more to Elvis Presley than meets the eye, much more. These documents prove that Elvis Presley may have had a life or death reason for disappearing from public view. And they also hold information that strongly suggests he was still alive at least four years after he was found dead. Now, during this show, we're not going to open any vaults. We're not going to dwell on the Elvis that the world knows so well, the singer, the musician, the actor, and the star. Instead, we're going to show you an Elvis that you never knew before, a man who may have risked everything for the good of his country. We've brought together a panel of experts who think there was a whole lot more to Elvis Presley than meets the eye, and they're going to share what they know with you. But first, we need to go back to that tragic day in August of 1977, when the world learned that Elvis Presley was gone. My father was listening to the radio in the back while he was working, and when he told us, we just stopped and cried. It was unbelievable. He's a guy that shouldn't be dead today. And the radio announced that uh, he died, and God, we both looked at each other and said, we couldn't believe it, you know. I do remember being, you know, crying and being all upset because you know, he had that, you had that feeling about him like he was one of, one of us. It was on the television, the news is how I heard about it. I just felt very sad. He's like one of the greatest musicians that ever lived. Every time I see Elvis or hear Elvis sing or see a movie, I get this real warm feeling. I remember him dying and I hope his soul's in heaven. He was a very sensitive and very kind, compassionate human being. Elvis was the best, the greatest, and of course, the king. It didn't take very long after the announcement that Elvis Presley had died for the crowds of mourners to gather. From all over the world, they came to pay their final respects to a man whom they felt had always respected them. Elvis had been placed in a casket, open for viewing at Graceland. No cameras were allowed by order of the Presley estate. Silently, mourners passed by to say their final farewells. Elvis's cousin, Gene Smith, felt he had to personally say goodbye to the man he had loved so much. When we viewed the body for the last time, I stood there quite a while looking at, looking at his hands. And, uh, of course, he was always breaking bricks with his hands. He had calluses on the bottom of his hand and big old rough looking knuckles. His nose would look kind of puggy looking and his right sideburn was sticking out straight out about, looked about an inch. And his hairline was, looked as if it had been a, a hair piece or something glued on somewhere. It just didn't look right. And uh, his hands was just as smooth as a, a newborn baby's behind, you know. And it seemed like it was sweating on his, around his hairline. It could have been sweat, it could have been glow, I don't know. But uh, I just didn't believe it was him. Jean was not the only person who noticed that something seemed odd. Maria Columbus, for 20 years now, the president of the Elvis Presley fan club, also experienced some things out of the ordinary. Now, when I spoke to Maria a few weeks back, she had this to say. Tell me what happened when you learned of Elvis's passing. We were very shocked. And the first thing we did was call Graceland. And uh, we tried to get hold of Elvis's father, but he was obviously busy. And so we left a message to have him call us. And about 30, 40 minutes later, Vernon Presley called us. We told him that we were gonna be you know, flying out there within a couple of hours, and Vernon asked us not to come. But he told us that it was going to be too hectic and too emotional at that time, and too busy, he wouldn't be able to, to really see us, and uh, he said it would be better if we went the week after. Why do you think that Vernon asked you 
to wait a week before you came there. We thought that perhaps he felt we would have noticed things, you know, little details that weren't right and we would have questioned them. And maybe it would have caused uh, an embarrassing moment for the family. When you got there a week later, mm -hmm. what was the atmosphere? It was a very carnival atmosphere. We went over to the cemetery. Um, Elvis was in a mausoleum. And there were um, people selling Cokes and popcorn. And there were people posing with the guards because they had guards in front of the mausoleum door. We felt nothing of Elvis. And that was carried over um, a few months later when we got a hold of the inventory of Elvis's estate. Mm -hmm. It's about 84 pages long. And it felt wrong. There were so many things missing that should have been on there. I mean, uh, personal items that you were aware of? Right. Um, Elvis's diaries were not listed, his journals. Mm -hmm. um, there was even a plane missing. Um, he was listed as having six or seven pieces of jewelry, and you know, I'm sure you know Elvis had more jewelry than that. Oh, yeah. No photographs of his mother listed, um, none of his daughter. But he had quite a number of photographs of his yeah. mother, if I remember correctly. Right. But if it wasn't Elvis Presley in the coffin, then who was it? Someone who might have that answer is Gail Brewer Giorgio. Gail is the author of the best selling books, The Elvis Files and Is Elvis Alive? Now, here's what she had to say when we spoke last week. Let me ask you a question with regard to your book, The Elvis Files. It's significant to you that the name Aaron was misspelled. Why is that so significant? Elvis was born an identical twin. His twin brother, Jesse Guerin, died at birth. With great thought and deliberation, Elvis's parents named him Elvis, A-R-O-N. So that whenever Elvis saw the name of Jesse Guerin, he'd always know that Aaron was a part of Guerin. So emphatic were his parents to have A-R-O-N spelled with a single A, that when the doctor mistakenly filled out the first birth certificate with two A's, this was on January 10th, 1935, they insisted a new one be written, which was dated January 12th, 1935, this new one with the single A spelling. From the time Elvis was able to sign his name, it was Elvis A-R-O-N. Elvis himself told many people he spelled his middle name with a single A. Biographers and researchers attest to this spelling. Even the Tennessee Historical Commission reports it's A-R-O-N, not A-A-R-O-N. All legal documents show it as A-R-O-N. Yet on Elvis's grave, it is misspelled. It reads Elvis A-A-R-O-N Presley. Why? As you know, Elvis was, was steeped heavily in numerology that by adding another A to his name, he changed the, vi changed the vibrations of his letters. And he would have been a higher spiritual number. He would have gone up to a nine. Ladies and gentlemen, Gail Brewer Giorgio. All right, I must ask, Gail, isn't it possible that in, in the haste of putting Elvis to rest, some innocent mistakes remain? Well, I think the key word, Bill, is haste. Why the haste in having such a grand funeral? Why the misspelling of a name on a grave? Why the moving of the grave? That doesn't make sense. And I believe that a lot of these so-called mistakes are clues. I'd like to introduce you to Monty Nicholson, an investigator with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, and author of The Presley Arrangement, Monty Nicholson. <laughs> Welcome, Monty. Hi, Monty. First question, Monty, do you think there's a remote possibility that Elvis could still be alive? Based on what I've seen so far, I think the possibility is very real. All right. Now, Monty, you're a member in good standing with the law enforcement community, so aren't you a little concerned about what your colleagues might say? Well, of course, I do take some teasing from my peers, but they know that this is something I do outside my career of law enforcement. I just try to do things thorough enough to dispel any real criticism. All right. When I visited with you uh, some weeks ago, we discussed your views 
on the discrepancies surrounding Elvis's death. The story released to the public said Elvis died in his bathroom and was discovered by his girlfriend, Ginger Alden. Supposedly, the authorities were notified and resuscitation attempts were continued until Elvis's body was removed. Contrary to what one would expect, a house in disarray and emotional upheaval, speculation has it that not only were the bedroom and bathroom cleaned up, but Ginger Alden, prior to the arrival of the authorities, took the time to get dressed and gain her composure. If Elvis died in the morning, how is it possible that he could be getting on a helicopter later that day without being observed? Well, Bill, I'm not sure that he wasn't observed. Why are you not sure of that? In 1977, Monty was contacted by a man who claimed he worked for Elvis. He also claimed to have taken two photos of Elvis boarding a helicopter with government agents after the time of his alleged death. Upon seeing the photos, Monty became intrigued by the possibility that Elvis may have faked his death. He contacted the man with the photos. At first, he denied having them. Then he changed his mind, adding, it will cost you to see them again. Monty arranged a meeting with him and went to the address he gave, only to find a vacant house. That man has since disappeared. Inspired by this incident, Monty decided to write the Presley Arrangement, which tells the story of how Elvis may have faked his own death. The Presley Arrangement was published and placed in a major bookstore chain. Strangely enough, soon after the book started to sell, it also started to disappear. Monty continued to research and write about the mystery concerning the death of Elvis. He was contacted by Gail Brewer Giorgio. During his first conversation, he learned that Gail's book, Orion, had also disappeared from the bookstore shelves. Gail and Monty exchanged information for several months. They concluded that their books may have been suppressed by the same people. I don't mean to be callous when I say this, but isn't it possible that the book just didn't sell? Of course, and it's always possible any book wouldn't sell. I called my publicist, and I asked him about this problem. I said, you know, I have friends that are going into the bookstores and asking for my book, and they're being told that they can't even order it. Yet you tell me it's still in the catalog of books in print. He said in 35 years in the publishing business, he'd never heard of such a thing. There were other discrepancies surrounding Elvis's death. First, in March of 1977, before Elvis died, two life insurance policies were cashed in. A secret personal checking account was emptied out shortly before Elvis Presley died. The amount? Close to a million dollars. And perhaps most odd, some claim that the signature on Elvis's death certificate matches Elvis's own handwriting. We asked handwriting analyst Paul Wiest to look at these signatures, and here were his thoughts. I was asked by Gail Gorgio to examine some handwriting of Elvis Presley. She supplied me with a copy of a letter written to President Nixon in 1970 and the death certificate or medical examiner's report at the time of his reported death. I examined these two documents and compared them by measuring the slant of the handwriting, the spacing between the letters, spacing between the words, the size of the letters, and the individual letter formations. I also made transparent photocopies where I could lay one photocopy, a uh, transparent copy on top of another one for close comparison. I examined these under transmitted light with a light table. The result of my examination was that I found that the slant matched on both documents, that the size of the letters was the same, the spacing between the letters was the same, and many of the individual letter forms were the same. My conclusions after this exhaustive examination was, in my professional opinion, as a document examiner, that the same person who wrote the letter to President Nixon also wrote the Elvis Presley death certificate or medical examiner's report of Elvis Presley's death. So far, we have addressed the possibility that Elvis might not have passed away when everyone thought he did. Now, let's assume for a moment that that's true and that he is alive. It stands to reason that someone, somewhere, would have encountered him. Gail, why don't you tell us how you became involved in this case? Well, I, I, like the rest of the world, heard the news that Elvis Presley died at the age of 42, and I was shocked. When I heard that Elvis Presley had died, I was amazed. 
it seemed that almost overnight a very mortal man was deified. My curiosity led me to write the novel Orion, a fictitious story about a singer who was a prisoner of his fame, a man who ended up hoaxing his own death. The book was sold to a major publisher, a sizable advance was received, as well as a promise of extensive promotion. After the book was released, I began receiving calls that the books were rapidly disappearing under very strange circumstances. More than one store reported that men in business suits came in and purchased the books in quantities, and that once they were gone, the stock was never replenished, which is a very strange business practice. My repeated calls to the publisher were ignored, my questions unanswered. Meanwhile, as I was investigating the mysterious disappearance of my book, the media and many of the fan clubs were questioning the death of Elvis Presley. Several fans brought to my attention the fact that Elvis's middle name was misspelled on his grave at Graceland. This and other discrepancies led me to write, Is Elvis Alive? I was then contacted by Monty Nicholson, a veteran investigator with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, who had written a book called The Presley Arrangement, which focuses on Elvis faking his death. Monty and I compared notes and found that despite never having heard of each other, our information was almost identical. My appearances on radio and television shows led to many phone calls, leads, lots of new information. Now, how many, please, in our audience have been to Graceland? May we see some hands? Ooh, quite a number of you. All right. What would you think if you'd visited Graceland, taken some typical tourist pictures, and then in the privacy of your living room, notice what seemed to be the face of Elvis Presley staring right out at you? I think you'd get very excited. Well, this is precisely what happened to a man named Mike Joseph on New Year's Eve Day, December 31st, 1977. Now, recently, Mike was interviewed about the events leading up to this amazing picture. Let's watch. It was New Year's Eve, 77, when I uh, took my wife and my son and my nephew down to Graceland. They had just opened up uh, Memory Gardens where Elvis was laid to rest. And we were there for an hour, and um, we left uh, back for home. Had the pictures developed, and uh, looked at them, put them away. One day after reading a book, I decided to look at my pictures again. I, I pulled them out, and this time, I saw something in one of the pictures that I hadn't seen. My God, I had Elvis Presley sitting in the doorway, looking out at the fans walking past his grave. I have had the negatives examined by Kodak. And Kodak uh, basically says that they uh, are original. They have not been tampered with in any way. They were taken in sequence, uncut by the negatives, uh, being original, they can tell. The emulsion number of the film was manufactured in 77. Uh, each a roll of film that is manufactured is, has a manufacturing date on it in the emulsion number. This is the shot that I took of the people walking and the, uh, the bathhouse in the uh, distance. We zero in here, and this is the same shot uh, with just the chair. No one sitting in the chair. So that shows it was not a picture of someone sitting in the chair. This is my son once again blocking the doorway, and of course the picture where I first spotted the, uh, the silhouette in the doorway. How many of you think that Mike Joseph photographed Elvis Presley? May we see some hands? Well, perhaps the most convincing piece of evidence that suggests that Elvis may still be alive is the mystery audio tape. Now, let's take a brief listen before we continue. About the, uh, at the time, uh, I had a beard and I lost a few pounds. And I thought it would be I thought it would be very, very hard for anyone to recognize me. All right, this tape was released to the general public in, in Gail Giorgio's book, Is Elvis Alive? Now, at the time, the origin of the tape was unknown. But since the publication of that book, new information has been uncovered. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce Maria Columbus, the president of the oldest Elvis Presley fan club. Hi, Maria.
Okay. Now, Maria, will you please tell us about the tape? Okay. I received this tape in 1981 from Steve Chances from Florida. Mm -hmm. He had written a book called Elvis, Where Are You? Now, on this tape, you only hear Elvis speaking. The person he was speaking to was edited out. Yes, I noticed. I noticed that. Huh? Well, part of it was edited out. Why would anyone edit out one of the parts of the conversation? That sounds sort of suspicious to me. Yes, I, it's suspicious to me, too. Um, the only thing I can think of is that the person did not want to be recognized. But I believe it is Elvis speaking. Curiouser and curiouser. All right. We brought in an audio analyst to find out if the voice on the tape is, in fact, that of Elvis Presley. Have two years of sobering army life changed your mind about rock and roll? Sobering army life. Uh, no, it hasn't. It, it hasn't. It hasn't changed my mind because I was in tanks for a long time, you see. And uh, they rock and roll quite a bit. <laughs> I started traveling all over the world. And it's been, uh, it's been enjoyable, but it's, it's been a constant battle of uh, growing beards and and this and that to, to keep them being recognized. Who was recorded during that 1981 phone conversation? Was it Elvis Presley? One way we can find out is to utilize some tools from law enforcement to electronically contrast and compare the voice of the real Elvis Presley and the voice on the tape. L.H. Williams works with a major police department in Texas and is an expert on audio voice prints and here is his report. Gail had sent me a copy of a transcript of the tape recording of the unknown person. And uh, this was four pages long. In this process, I also requested copies of known tape recordings of Elvis Presley. And I followed the guidelines that were established during the Watergate case for uh, possible authentication of the tape recording. I selected the same words and phrases of the known and the unknown person for comparison purposes. This is the known sample of Elvis Presley stating the word music. This is a sample from the unknown tape recording showing the word music. The formats that were formed fall within the same frequency range through here which would indicate a match. Basically the known voice of Elvis Presley compared with the voice on this tape is the same. Now let's assume for a second that this test conclusively proves that Elvis made this recording. Can we be sure that it was made after 1977? We've made a transcription of the recording and we marked down specific things that the caller said. If any one of these comments describes events that happened after Elvis's alleged death, then the argument that he might still be alive is stronger. Ask me all the time when I'm living. Naturally, I can't say, but uh, it's a good place to hide. And there was an island that I had learned about a long time ago, and uh, I guess I always knew that someday I'd probably have to use it. Anyway, I. I must have spent a year on the island. I started traveling all over the world. And it's been, uh, it's been enjoyable, but it's, it's been a constant battle of uh, growing beards and, and this and that to, to keep from being recognized. And I guess I guess about two years ago, I, I went to Europe, which is uh, something I, I, I've always wanted to do, something I've wanted to do for a long time. I realized that sooner or later, it's probably going to end. You know, I, I hate to think that it's going to end, but I know sometimes 
secret has got to be let out. If it hadn't been for getting involved in what I'm involved in now, you know, things as such may have been different. Well, I think that last statement speaks for itself. But, Maria, let me ask you about some of the other things that we heard. Prior to his death, had Elvis ever spent a year on an island, any island? No, he didn't. He never spent a year away from the public eye. He was in, in the public eye all the time. We would have heard about it. All right. When Elvis was 24, we know that he was in the Army, and he went to Europe. But did he go to Europe two years before that? No. The first time he went to Europe was when he was... Uh, going to Germany in the army in 1958. Now so far we've introduced you to witnesses who believe that Elvis Presley was not really buried in August of 1977. We've also presented evidence that Elvis Presley has been seen on multiple occasions and perhaps most importantly we presented what appears to be physical documentation that Elvis has been photographed and recorded. Now let's make an assumption for a moment. Elvis Presley staged his own death. Why would a man, blessed with wealth, fame, extraordinary talent, choose to vanish from the public this way? Just who was Elvis Presley? Rock and roller, movie star, devoted father, world famous celebrity. There was the public Elvis, and then there was the private Elvis. Two of his favorite hobbies were law enforcement and religious studies. Both of these passions may have inspired the chain of events that took place on August 16th, 1977. Before Elvis Presley wanted to be a singer, he wanted to be in law enforcement. By 1970, Elvis had received many honorary and real law enforcement credentials and was convinced that he had unique services he could offer his country. And being Elvis, he decided to get what he wanted by going straight to the top. In December of 1970, Elvis flew to Washington, D.C., writing a letter en route to then President Richard Nixon. Dear Mr. President, first, I would like to introduce myself. I am Elvis Presley and admire you and have great respect for your office. I talked to Vice President Agnew in Palm Springs one week ago and expressed my concerns for our country. The drug culture, the hippie elements, the SDS, Black Panther, etc do not consider me as their enemy, or as they call it, the establishment. I call it America. In this letter, Elvis volunteered to become a federal agent, saying his contacts with the youth culture would allow him access into worlds that other undercover agents could only dream of penetrating. After the letter arrived at the White House, some of Nixon's aides debated whether it would be in the president's interest to meet with Presley. Here is the memo that decided the issue. Nixon took the advice and decided to meet with Elvis to give him the credentials he wanted. Elvis got his wish, a presidential appointment as a secret DEA agent. Some feel that Elvis was just playing make-believe, but it has been verified that Elvis allowed an undercover agent to infiltrate his road crew from 1974 to 1976. What was that secret agent investigating? Nobody will say for sure. At this same time, Elvis had become immersed in writings dealing with human spirituality and religion. Perhaps the most widely known entertainer in the world, Elvis was able to keep both of these sides of his personality a secret to the general public. His spiritual side he kept secret because he wanted to. His undercover life he kept secret because he had to. And this brings us to the FBI files. According to the records, there are more than 1,400 pages of files on Elvis Presley. The first stems from a citizen complaint in 1956, reporting Elvis's bad attitude. The last report was made in 1983 and describes the sale of a car that allegedly once belonged to Elvis. But by far the longest and most significant document covers the years 1976 to 1982. Containing over 1,000 pages, it concerns a criminal investigation and a man named Frederick Peter Pro. In order to make sense of these documents, We've invited one more distinguished guest to join us. His name is Luc Dion. He's from Quebec, and Luc formerly worked for the Quebec government, but for the last year, he's dedicated much of his spare time to uncovering the working of Operation Fountain Pen. 
Now, trying to condense 1,400 pages of FBI files is a daunting task, but Lugas managed to prepare a short-form version for us. Welcome, Luke. All right, Luke, to, uh, to summarize, what do you think happened to Elvis Presley? Well, I think that Elvis got involved in a very dangerous FBI undercover operation and uh, in order to protect himself, a member from his family has to arrange his disappearance. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. What you're about to see has been verified by recently declassified government documents and Luke Dion's own extensive research. Our story begins in May of 1976, when Elvis wanted to sell one of his airplanes. Besides the famous Lisa Marie, Elvis owned three smaller jets, a Lockheed Jetstar, a Jet Commander, and a Dassault Falcon. In early 1976, Elvis told his father, who handled all of his personal finances, that he wanted to sell the Jetstar. Vernon was loyal to his son, but was apparently not a very good businessman. Vernon was introduced to a man named Frederick Peter Pro in May of 1976. Pro talked Vernon into getting involved with a very complicated leasing arrangement with his company. The Jetstar wasn't airworthy, and Pro also said he would facilitate repairs. But Frederick Peter Pro was, in reality, a con man, a member of a criminal group called the Fraternity, a group with direct ties to organized crime. It has been estimated that the fraternity managed to con at least two billion dollars from people all over the world. And by the spring of 1977, according to an attorney familiar with the case, the Presley estate had lost more than a million dollars. Well, aside from Elvis being a victim of the fraternity, how does the Presley case relate to Operation Fountain Pen? At the time that Presley was defrauded by those con men, the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation were involved in a highly confidential undercover operation called Operation Fountain Pen regarding the uh, illegal activities of uh, a group of con men called the Fraternity that comprised approximately 30 to 40 of the world's top con men. What's the importance of the Presley case in Operation Fountain Pen? Well, the Presley case was the catalyst case for the FBI to stop temporarily the illegal activity of at least two members of the fraternity. What do you mean temporarily? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the fraternity was an organization that comprised 30 to 40 of the world's top con men. Now, the Presley case involved only two members of the fraternity. Now, this organization was still going around, you know, everywhere around the world, calling, defrauding people after the Presley case was done, but temporarily they succeeded in, it, in stopping the fraternity. The following is a chronology of the documented evidence that bear that some believe have resulted in the staged disappearance of Elvis Presley. <laughs> On March 4th, 1977, Elvis took his last leisure trip with his friends. According to several people, Elvis behaved unusually, almost as if he was saying goodbye. June 29, 1977, Elvis gave his last concert in Indianapolis. July 26, the FBI signaled that the investigation into Frederick Peter Pro finally had enough evidence to go to the grand jury. Early August, Elvis desperately tried to reach President Carter to discuss some urgent personal business. August 15th, United States Attorney Michael Cody advised the FBI that his office was ready to go before the grand jury with the Operation Fountain Pen case. August 16th, Elvis Presley is reported dead at Graceland. October 18th, four alleged members of the fraternity, including Frederick Peter Pro, were arrested in connection with the Presley fraud case. Could this investigation have led Elvis Presley to fake his own death? Do you think it was dangerous enough to justify a sudden disappearance. Well, that's the point. If you look at the criminal background of certain individuals who were involved in the Presley case, it would be highly justifiable. Do you think that Elvis was put under the witness protection program? 
Well, the fact that the two members of the fraternity were involved with Presley uh, in the Jet Star deal were themselves put under the witness security program is something in itself. If it was dangerous enough for the prime suspect to be put under the witness security program, it was surely good enough for Elvis Presley as the main victim to be put under the, the program. But Elvis Presley was a, a federal agent. There's no doubt about that. All right, Gail, what do you think of all this? Well, there is no doubt about it. Elvis Presley was a federal agent. His power and clout went to the White House. President Nixon made his appointment. We also know by records that Elvis Presley received a call from President-elect Jimmy Carter at the end of 1976. And President Carter wanted to appoint Elvis to a special commission in the Carter administration. Another call was placed by the FBI between President Carter and Elvis on August 15, 1977. Elvis's name is listed in the Justice Department's Black Book as a federal agent. Plus, there's books on at Graceland that uh, seem to be clues. And during Elvis's last concert tour, he, he made some very strange remarks on stage. He would, it, it sounded like he was saying goodbye. He would say things like, I am, and I was. And he also said to the audience, he said, I may not look good tonight, but I will look good in my coffin. Well. Couldn't all of this simply mean that uh, Elvis planned to take his own life? It was suggested that he was deeply upset over uh, a lot of books that had recently come out. Anyone that knows anything about Elvis Presley knows he was very religious. He's even made statements that suicide was immoral. However, everyone knows how Elvis felt about his nine-year-old daughter, Lisa Marie. That was the longest visit she had at Graceland at that time. She was there. The only other bedroom upstairs at Graceland is Lisa's. Do you really think that Elvis Presley would chance his daughter finding a suicide body? And beyond that, Elvis Presley, on the evening of August 15th and into the early hours of August 16th, made an emergency dental appointment to have some work done. That doesn't sound like a man who he was planning to take his life in a few hours. Maybe he was planning death, but not suicide. All right. Let us assume that Elvis did not take his own life. Let us also assume that Elvis did not die of natural causes. Now, do these FBI documents ever mention anything that suggests that Elvis Presley did not die August 17th, 1977. Luke, I put that to you. Well, when you closely examine those documents, we can find numerous notation and correction that has been made in what I believe is Elvis's handwriting. And I think that I, I'm almost positive that I, Elvis Presley continued his involvement in Operation Fountain Pen for several years after his alleged death. Okay. Now, we brought these documents to handwriting analyst Paul Wiest. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Weiss. Welcome, Paul. Okay, Paul, you have seen these documents. What is your conclusion? Yes, I certainly have, Bill. Uh, this first one, I don't think it's it or not, but we have Frederick N. Prohl, uh, et al. Elvis A. Presley, deceased victim. Mm -hmm. This little circle down here in this cross indicates they should delete this, and here's what was written above to change it and correct it. N-A-M, short for name, they left off the E, Frederick Peter Prohl. This handwriting was compared with known handwriting of Elvis Presley, and it matches very, very closely. All right, what about the one that says to Memphis? All right, this is the one that says to Memphis here. And uh, this is also references Frederick Peter Prohl, mm -hmm. Elvis Presley, deceased, victim. And down here on the bottom, we see uh, 0 0.73 to Memphis, 8-15-78. I have compared this to known handwriting of Elvis Presley's and find that this also matches very, very favorably right. to the handwriting. Now, to what did you compare all of this writing? I had a great deal great number of samples of his known handwriting. Number one, of course, was the Nixon letter, the letter that he wrote in 1970 to President Nixon. Mm -hmm. I had uh, several canceled checks written by Elvis Presley. I had a Christmas gift list. I had a letter to some other friends. 
uh, restaurant check mm -hmm. that he had signed, and numerous other pieces. So, several documents. Several documents. Much, enough all materials, surely, to, to all compare. All authenticated is known handwriting. All right, now what about the issue that Elvis Presley signed his own death certificate? Well, that, let me hand this back to you, though. Okay. Number one, that's a misnomer. This is the death certificate. When we say Elvis Presley signed his own death certificate, it's not the death certificate, it is a medical examiner's report, as you can see. Yes. He didn't sign it. This was signed by the medical examiner down here. All right. But the name right on here, the street address, is 3764 Elvis Presley Boulevard. That, I believe, is in Elvis Presley's own handwriting. Also over here under Occupation Entertainer. They both match up very closely, so the known handwriting. All of it Presley. was, in, in your professional opinion, Elvis Presley's handwriting? Yes, it was. Okay. Now, Paul's findings were corroborated by handwriting analyst Sheila Lowe. Now, Ms. Lowe is qualified by the California Supreme Court as an expert witness in document examination. We asked Ms. Lowe to compare 10 pages of questionable handwriting notations made in the estate of Elvis Presley inventory dated December 19th, 1977, with a known verified sample of Elvis Presley's handwriting. Each document was viewed with transmitted light on a light table and examined under a microscope. Under penalty of perjury, Ms. Lowe issued the following opinion, and I quote, After careful examination of the documents, it is the opinion of the undersigned that the handwriting on all documents was executed by the same writer. Okay, Marty, you have seen all the evidence so far. In your professional opinion, do you think that Elvis may have written on his own FBI files? Well, we only speculate that Elvis may be in a uh, a member or involved somehow in a government protection program of some type mm -hmm. but we know he was a DEA agent and most probably he was involved in working on his own investigation at this point I think that we should summarize what we've learned so far it has been suggested that on August 16 1977 in order to protect himself and his family from a criminal organization called the fraternity Elvis Presley arranged things to look as if he had died he accomplished this with the help of the Department of Justice by somehow planting either a wax dummy or another body at Graceland. He also secured the cooperation of local officials in covering up both the autopsy results and the trail that might have led to finding out the truth. Then, deliberately misspelling his middle name, Elvis arranged for his coffin to be placed one space over from where he really planned to be interred. Elvis was relocated by the Witness Protection Program to a secret location and has maintained a low profile ever since. He has continued to be in contact with his family and closest friends and has made at least two phone calls that have been recorded. He has been seen and photographed several times and has made at least one trip to Europe. According to the people who believe this theory, he may soon return to his public. How many of you now think there's a chance that Elvis Presley might still be alive. Would you raise your hands, please? That's an amazing percentage change. Now, I've been asked many times, uh, Bill, isn't this show exploiting Elvis's death? Yes, was my feeling. In fact, when I was first asked to host this program, I said no for exactly that reason. But then a body of evidence was presented to me that made the circumstances of August 16th, 1977 debatable. Uh, the more I considered what was in front of me, the more I felt that this was an opportunity to present to the world information which had never been brought to light. Now, the next question asked of me, if you're his friend and he is alive, aren't you jeopardizing that same life? Well, anybody interested in using the information presented in this program, information which has been available for at least four years, would have done so a long time ago. So if Elvis is alive, he's obviously well protected. Now certain evidence seen here even suggests that Elvis himself may be reaching out. If anything can be said of this program, hopefully, is that we have left his life with dignity. And I thank you. Thank you, Luke.